co-host, Janelle Blue, who's the president of the Mount Vernon Genealogical Society. And the topic that we decided to talk about today is one that I think is important to research for anyone, and that's gathering information and stories and conducting an interview with family members because we can go out and search for records, but if we don't have a clue of what to search for, we're stuck. So oftentimes we want to conduct an interview with family members and you know the first thing that that we want to do and that I think is the most important is get in touch with and talk to the oldest people in the family because we never know how long they are going to be with us and they have not only information about their generation and maybe the generation before, but may have heard the family stories passed down from earlier generations. Unfortunately, I didn't get into genealogy research until after all four of my grandparents were long gone. I had one grandfather who would talk and tell family stories. I had a grandmother who, who did, but she died when I was 16, so I didn't really have a long time of hearing those family stories. I How waited, about you? I waited a long time uh, to do that, and my mother w was already experiencing a fair amount of dementia, dementia, but her sister came to visit, and so my mother was like in her late 80s, and her sister was only a few years younger. I put them in a room together, <laughs> and my and because my my aunt was pretty, you know, she talkative and animated, and she knew lots of details, that helped to trigger my mother's memory, right. and um, and so that was an excellent experience that I tape recorded. And after my aunt died, I sent copies of those tapes to her children. They were so grateful to have that interview. It's, it's, it's great to have those interviews on tape and because then you have the person's voice. You know, I, for a long time, um, really didn't have much of my father, but I had the tape for the answering machine that I, that I <laughs> held on to, and, and I still have it around the house somewhere. So, so the first thing that we really want to talk about is planning the interview because you you really need to do some planning before you just go out there and interview people although opportunities do present themselves mm -hmm. and you have to jump when when the the iron is hot and so the first thing is to make a, a list of potential people that you're going to interview uh, and as I said start with or prioritize with the oldest people in the family. Uh, my mother's sister, fortunately, was still around when I got into genealogy. In fact, she was around for quite a while. And she was not only my grandparents' oldest child, but her mother's oldest grandchild, or mother's uh, parents' oldest grandchild. And so, she and I would, would talk, and I'd talk to her, interview her, and after I, I did this initially, not really so much a formal interview, but after my uncle passed away, she moved down near, she lived outside of Philadelphia at the time, and then she moved down near Ocean City, New Jersey, to be close to her grandchildren, and so I would, always take Thanksgiving weekend. I'd go home for Thanksgiving, and Friday I would go down, and I'd spend Friday, Friday night, Saturday, and sometimes Saturday night with her. We'd go over to Ocean City and, and walk the boardwalks. It's a nice time not to have crowds, although sometimes it could be a little cold, but I had plenty of time to talk to her and, you know, ask questions and we did other things and we could go back and forth with questions and all, particularly as she got a little older and sometimes I'd find there'd be a little confusion start to, mm -hmm. to 
creep into the picture? My mother, when I was younger, even before I started a serious genealogy search, I would ask her, you know, tell me about our family. Tell me some stories. Well, what do you want to know? No. <laughs> and, 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 and then I would respond because I didn't know better. I'd say, well, tell me anything, right. you know. And so those are not the right kinds of questions, questions. to ask. <clears throat> um, and, and so when I, when I started with this interview with my aunt and my mother, um, I knew some of the I knew some of the things that they had gone through when they were young girls in the Depression. And so I started with some open-ended questions about, you know, what was life like in, during the Depression? What, you know, right. and that opened up, well, first of, you know, the first response was it was hard. Yes. <laughs> and then taking it one step at a time from there and being specific, well, did you have enough food to eat? Did you ever go hungry? And then start the stories of, well, yeah, you know, daddy would go out to the country where our relatives were and, and bring in, you know, food so that we could eat and so forth. And that helped to trigger those memories. My mother has a memory of my aunt that lasted for all the years they were alive. And it was when she was a young child and, and they had gone to the store and some, my mother had done something that wasn't going to please my grandmother. My aunt went running back to the grandmother to tattle on her. <laughs> and at age 90, with, with increased dementia, that story came back out with all of the emotion that my mother has felt all those years. That was, a, that was a real experience. I'm quite sure that I can always say that they, they weren't confused about that about, one. Yes, and, that, but those are the best ones because it that, tells you something about those people and their relationship. It, and, and it gives you the, the emotion and, it, and it's something that stuck with them all of, yes. all of that, yes. that time. Uh, you know, one of, one of the things that no matter what you do in planning, the interview, it doesn't always work out. My mother had a uh, cousin. My grandmother had two sisters, and the older of her two sisters became a widow at a fairly young age. My great-grandmother also became a widow. And so my great-aunt Emma had to go out and support her family. Fortunately, she was a nurse. So after my great-grandfather died, my great-grandmother, who also was Emma, moved in with her daughter, Emma, to help raise her children. So mm -hmm. she took care of them when their mother was, was off working. And so I, for five years, my, my mother's cousin was about eight or 10 years older, retired, and they bought a motorhome. And he and his wife used to travel the country. And, their children were still back in Pennsylvania. So they would come back at Thanksgiving time and usually stay till shortly after New Year's. And periodically, depending on what was going on with their grandchildren, they would come back for events. But I tried working with my mother. We tried for five years to get a time, because at the time I was still working at least part time, to find a time when I could go up when her cousin would be back in the area, we could get together. After five years, we set this up. They came down to my parents' house, sat there having coffee and cake, and I got out my notebook and started to ask her cousin questions. And he got up and he said, they're dead. Leave them alone. What do you want to <laughs> And walked into the living room and wouldn't talk to me about anything. And I, I was... One of the questions I was trying to find out was, when did my great-grandfather die? When did his grandfather die? Because we didn't know, and I couldn't get mm -hmm. access to records because they were closed because of the length of time mm -hmm. that, that had, had uh, happened. And so his wife did try to help me, but she didn't know him until he was 16, and my great-grandmother was gone by then. Maybe you just needed to know the right trigger words <laughs> to get him to turn I, around and say, well, wait a minute, you're not right about that. I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I didn't really 
know anything mm. to to really trigger anything mm. and so so that was extremely disappointing so you know you you do have those kinds of things that happen but you know chuck most people like to talk about themselves and a lot people, of times and most people yeah. especially when they get to be of an age they like to remember things even if sometimes their memory didn't quite right, get it yeah. right but and so for most people if you can just get them started, started. then they enjoy doing yeah, it. I, I generally found that that's very true. I, I you know, could ask questions and, and they would do that. But, mm -hmm. you know, he, he just, you know, was, was not willing to do it. So, so one of the things that's really important is scheduling the time frame, arranging a date, and hopefully it doesn't take you five years to, to get somebody to, to be available. But, you know, sometimes it's spur of the moment. Uh, I always took a, whenever I went to, particularly funerals, but weddings too, but funerals, because that's the time I would find that the family would be talking. So I'd always take something to scribble notes on mm -hmm. so that I had a time. But, but you want to arrange a time that's convenient and you want to let people know beforehand what it is that you're going to want to do. Why do you want to talk to them? And, and this was the, the thing, I mean, my mother was up front. She told her cousin what I wanted to talk about. I wanted to find out about my, my uh, great-grandmother. And you know, one of the things that even was a problem for me with trying to determine a time when she had died, I had asked my mother and I had asked my mother's oldest sister. And my mother distinctly remembered her grandmother coming and spending a month in the summertime. And she always said about, it was the, the time frame, the summer before she turned 12, mm -hmm. which would have been 1940, September of 1940. My mother's sister said, oh no, she died in the late 20s or early 1930s. So I have two wide. And when I finally, uh, actually I finally found something that my mother found in, in, I guess, my grandmother's house. It was a poem from my great aunt Emma to my great grandmother and it was dated May 1938. It was a framed mm. picture with mm. a poem. Mm -hmm. And so I knew my aunt was way off. My mother hit it close when I finally found the actual date. She died in 1939, so. You know, the value of these is, uh, it, this reminds me of when I go to the library and I go to some of the private uh, uh, content that they have, some of the papers that people have donated. And when I'm trying to do research on a particular family, and I want to be able to add that environmental information, you know, what was life like during that time, okay. and, and how did they fit into that, and what impacted them? By reading something that was written by somebody, somebody. 150 years ago, even though it's very ordinary, it's just a guy's recollection of what life was like on that particular week mm -hmm. or that particular year, that helps me yes. all these years later be able to yes. understand what life was like for my ancestor during that time and place. Yes. And that can still happen today. And, and particularly, there, there are projects that have been done. The Library of Congress had one interviewing men who were in the military, particularly uh, they were trying to get anybody who was, was in World War I, but World War II, the Korean War, mm -hmm. and, and also sometimes communities. I know in Arlington County for the, the United States Bicentennial in 1976, they interviewed the older people in Arlington communities and taped those, and so you get a flavor of what things are like. Another thing that I found very helpful 
to get background information is read the newspapers. When my parents celebrated their 50th anniversary, I went into the newspaper, and I've seen books and cards that have done this, you know, in such and such a year, this cost this, and so I gathered information on things out of the grocery store, uh, what a new car cost, things like that, and I put together this two-page little sheet of information that we put at every place setting. And some of my parents' friends were, where did you get all of this? And I said, I read the December 1948 uh -huh. newspapers, uh -huh. gathered it all. They didn't have a clue. Who you know, that's over. a great idea because that could stimulate other questions like, um, you know, who, the, whoever, what, what other political what thing was going, going on at on? the time, yeah. or what was the, I just love those newspapers where they advertise all of those uh, lotions and, and, and things yes. that are going to cure cancer, cancer. by just having yes. a drop or two of it every day. Yes. And, 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 you know, those people probably use those products at yes. the time. And, and that was one of the things I, I included, some some events and, you know, what was playing at the movies mm -hmm. and, and a little bit on other things. So, you know, when we, when we go to an interview, um, we definitely want to plan how are we going to take down the material. And I find if we can tape record it, that's great. That's the best. It's yeah. easier than scribbling notes. Mm -hmm. And again, sometimes people may be hesitant to be taped. I know I used to hate as a kid to hear my voice on tape. Really? Yes, I'm, I'm still not crazy about it. <laughs> so, but one of the things that I found was handy, if, if you've got a tape recorder and, and the people are agreeable, that's great. But I found that there are little tiny pocket tape recorders that are a little bit bigger than a pack of cigarettes that you can discreetly put in your pocket if somebody's going to object. And of course, Whatever you're recording on, you want to make sure that you have batteries or have an extension cord and everything that, that you're going to uh, need to do it. Or if you're mm -hmm. going to take and write everything down, then you, know, you want to make sure that you get the notes down. And of course, you, you, you do really want agreement from yes. somebody. that you, Yes. That, and, but the fact that you put it in your pocket means that it's probably not as intimidating Dating. as having it sit out and, on, the, and, on the table. And, you know, and I, it's not <laughs> something that I, I have done very often, but, you know, occasionally, and then, you know, you just use it for your private use. You're not mm -hmm. going to, mm -hmm. to share it with the family. I also found that going to cemeteries that was quite helpful, rather than trying to write things down, I can walk a cemetery and just dictate into the recorder and then right. I have to listen to my voice when I transcribe it. Well, having, having a smartphone now has really yes. changed everything yeah. in that regard, and especially if you can videotape. Yeah, um, yeah. Although some of uh, the problem I found with, with uh, taking pictures, sometimes tombstones are just not camera friendly. No, that's true. <laughs> and, that's, that's you know, true. Some of the other things that you may uh, find that you want to take is, you know, you might want to take, number one, a list of questions and ask open-ended questions. We don't want to say, well, you were born in such an, mm -hmm. you know, ask when were you born or where were you born. You might take some family group sheets, you might take some pictures, or you might take a document or two to, to discuss, or you might uh, you know, find something else, a family heirloom that, that you might want to take along. I went to visit one of my father's cousins, and I had a bunch of pictures I knew came from my grandparents' house. I knew that they were pictures of her family, but I didn't know which of her brothers were in the pictures, so I took those along. Well, lo and behold, she had pulled pictures out for me, and almost all of what I had, she had them plus. Oh, good, that worked. <laughs> so, but it was very easy to, to do that. Have you had a similar experience? Uh, I, or? Not, not the pictures so much, but um, I interviewed my aunt. This is a different side of the family, and she was in, you know, her 
mid-80s. And I asked her about her, the death of her sister. Her sister was, died at age 21, mm -hmm. and it was, the family had a story about it. I'd always heard the family, the story, but I hadn't really heard, you know, the, the real story. story. I just heard the, the data. And so I asked her about it, and she told me what she knew about it. And then we had lunch with my uncle, her, her brother, who was in his 90s already. Um, and, I, and I said, you know, I was having a conversation with my aunt, and she said this about your sister who died at 21. And he said, oh, I remember something different. Now, they were seven years apart. And that made all the difference. It they does. didn't have the same experience at the same time. And so they got different information. Their sources were different. And, and that's an important point to remember. Mm -hmm. I am six and a half years older than my oldest living sister. I had a sister that died with cerebral palsy when she was 22 months old and I was three and a half. And then I'm almost 11 years younger than my other two sisters that are a set of twins. And you know the perspective that I have versus the perspective that my one sister or the twins have, you know, uh, things that I distinctly remember, they don't have a clue. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was surprised. My grandmother died when I was 16. They were, the twins were five. And they don't really, really remember even my grandmother. You know, let alone anything with the time frame or the time that, mm -hmm. that she passed away. So, you know, whatever we, we need to do to possibly spark interest, uh, you know, and also people will possibly, if we let them know, do what my father's cousin did and bring out pictures and, mm -hmm. and things that, that they're willing to share. And that is, again, something that you may want to put on your take with you list that I always do. I always have the computer in the car and I have a small portable flatbed scanner that I can huh. hook up. So when she brought out those pictures after we were done talking, I went out got the equipment out of the car, set it all up, and sat there and scanned the pictures. And sometimes, too, after we leave, people will think about mm. things. And lo and behold, I got an envelope a couple of weeks later with a couple of more pictures that she found afterward that she hadn't thought of to pull out, that she went and had copies oh, made nice. and, and shared yeah. with me. So, you know, it. All kinds of things can come out of interviews, and one of the other things that, that you're talking about where you, you interviewed your aunt and then your uncle, I have a student that I just recently had in my beginner's class, and I talked about interviewing the older family members, and she did. She, she went and she interviewed one of her aunts, and then she went and interviewed one of her other aunts, and she got different information in some cases, but then she went back to the first aunt at one point, and she said, mentioned some of the things that the other, and, oh yes, ah. up popped more memory. Uh -huh. And so she really has been struggling with the family because the family moved around a lot. She was dealing with three different states and you know, also sometimes names because you have people who may have a given name but they may go by a nickname mm -hmm. and she was dealing with that. So it was really great to get the different perspectives of the two aunts. And, and also we always say, you know, be careful about family stories. Yes. Um, because there's usually a grain of truth somewhere, but you, you need the genealogical yes. proof standard, standard. Um, to, to make sure that what they are yes. saying is right. I have one situation where my, my friend always tell me this great story about how this guy just was so upset, he just walked out into the, into the yard and he just dropped dead. And she's told that story so many times with so much relish and it's always a good story. 
So we went to visit one of her elderly um, relatives who had lived in that area at the time. Now, there was quite a lot of age difference, difference. here between my friend and, and her aunt. And, um, and so she told that story in front of her aunt, and her aunt said, oh, that's not true. true. That <laughs> man didn't die. He just moved down the street. And so, I, so that's an example of how, you know, sometimes some validation is good yes. if you can find a second person some, who might know that. Yeah. Um, I just want to say a couple of things while we, if we have a minute, and that is try to transcribe everything that you get in, in, these, in these interviews. And then also document what, what, where, you, where you had the discussion, who you had it with, so that you have a citation that if you want to ever use it, you can do that. Um, that's really important. Yes, and, and age too is one of the important things in evaluating things and you know because as we get older memory does play tricks on mm. us mm. Uh, you know uh, my my grandfather my mother's father was very upfront and right on track with everything he told me and my father's mother you couldn't believe anything that she <laughs> said so Hopefully we've given you some ideas uh, and you know, after you get done with the interview, making sure that you do do something with it, add the information, go look for records and all. But hopefully this has given our viewers some new ideas of something to do to help get information, particularly if you don't have access to records, this gives you a starting point.